what you are looking at is the fastest passenger plane in the world. If 2400 km per hour maximum cruising speed doesn't ring a bell for you, it's an equivalent of one hour flight from Moscow to Paris or just 45 minutes in the air from New York to Miami. Sounds fast? That's because nowadays your average Boeing or Airbus can only fly safely in the range of 800 to 900 km per hour. This particular aircraft could bring you to your destination at least three times faster than any plane you've ever traveled with. But here it is, a monument to a Soviet engineering genius that will never fly again. This right here is a supersonic passenger aircraft, Tu-144, created by Tupolev Construction Bureau. This particular plane is one of the only seven remaining machines of its kind, and the last one to ever fly. It was decommissioned in 1999. Yes, it has already stopped flying in the last millennium, before the fast computers era. And you know what's more crazy? First to 144 that made commercial supersonic travel possible has been successfully tested over 50 years ago on December 31st of 1968. Well, technically Americans were first to break a sound barrier, which is around 1234 km per hour. For those of you who don't know what a sound barrier is, it's when a plane outspeeds the sound it creates by moving in the air mass. Douglas DC-8 airliner was the first one to do so in 1961, but that plane was not designed to fly so fast and the crew was lucky to just land alive. But 2144 was, so why don't we fly supersonic anymore? And why does nobody even remember that it was possible decades ago, before smartphones, before personal computers, before GPS, before even reliable autopilot systems? Well, let's find out. There were only 17 to 144s produced, and only 7 of them still exist in the whole world, of which 6 stay in Russia and only one aircraft you can find in Sinsheim's museum in Germany, near Stuttgart. Why Germany, you may ask? Reason would be turbulence economic turbulence. In the early 90s, after Soviet Union collapse, a Russian Flying Research Institute sold its unique plane because it didn't have money to even pay salaries for its pilots. For the same reason, more than half of these machines, which now would be considered priceless by any museum, were destroyed and sold for scrap metal. That's why you've probably never even heard of Tu-144. But you may have heard of another supersonic plane, French Concorde. If you perform a quick Google search, you may come to a conclusion that Concorde was a real deal, and those sneaky Soviets just sent their spies to France, but failed to properly copy the project. After all, Tu-144 has performed only 55 regular flights inside USSR for Aeroflot in the late 70s. Only 3,284 passengers were lucky enough to experience the flight on one of those. In comparison, Concorde was performing regular flights for many years. One of the two 144 aircraft crashed during air show in France shortly after the start of commercial use in USSR. Besides that, there were multiple problems with the range of distance and engine failure. So, two 144 was an inferior plane that crashed and failed too many times. Therefore, the project was scrapped for good. Case closed. Wait, let me ask you something. If this machine was stolen by Russian spies and came up so inferior, why on earth did I have to fly from Istanbul to Moscow for three and a half hours in 2021 in one of those new Boeings, when this old piece of scrap metal could do it in under one hour before I was even born? In fact, if this Soviet plane was not reliable, I wouldn't even be telling you this story right now. Why? Because my grandfather was a test pilot on Tu-144. Once he took my father as his co-pilot to fly one of those machines. And that was before I was even born. I seriously doubt you would be watching this if that plane failed. So the question remains, why don't we fly supersonic in 2021? Here it is, here's the plane. So where were the American spies for those 50 years? Why did they fail to copy and improve this so-called inferior machine that actually was in service? Spoiler alert, they did. The result is called Boeing 2707, bigger, faster, better, the paper plane, because it exists only on paper. Seriously, they tried. This exact machine served as a flying lab for a scientific project under Russia and USA collaboration, so they had their chance for sure. The US government, 
even tried to buy out the plane for NASA research purposes, but Russia refused. Couple of important facts. Despite spying accusations, Tu-144 has performed its first flight three months ahead of Concorde. Initially, cruising speed of Tu-144 was higher than Concorde's, but the range of distance was much shorter. Soviet engineers had to reduce cruising speed later to improve range of distance in modernized Tu-144D. So it was a completely different plane. The images look alike due to optimal streamlining design requirements, landing speeds, supersonic flight physics and other deep engineering stuff none of us really understands anyway. Tu-144 was created to connect the dots of the biggest country in the world and was somehow, believe it or not, considered to be the workhorse and the people's plane. On the other hand, Concorde made it possible for thousands of wealthy Air France and British Airways passengers to cross the Atlantic Ocean in a couple of hours. I've crossed the Atlantic on a modern commercial wide-body plane myself once. Not such a pleasant experience. Speeding it up three times would make so much sense. Well, it's not possible anymore. Tu-144 is dead. Concorde is dead too, despite being more commercially used. But why did theoretically superior supersonic planes give up the sky to modern slow, wide-body planes in the first place? Sure, both planes crashed. Sadly, it happens when the technology is raw. But couldn't the same engineers that created supersonic commercial technology just improve it? Well, they could, but it didn't happen. Because the answer is more complicated than that. Officially, the main concern and reason for shutting down both Concorde and Tu-144 projects was questionable safety. But it has more to do with economics and capitalism than you think. Concorde was designed for the first class passenger specifically. For the business sharks of 70s and 80s who valued their time and their ability to travel quickly between continents to do business. We're talking about time when time equals money was not just a cliché. A time before online video conferences were introduced and made this advantage less relevant. Tickets were ridiculously expensive, because the business stakes for those kinds of passengers were adequately high. I found different information on Concorde fares for different carriers and different time periods. 431 British pounds and 975 US dollars for one-way tickets respectively. So adjusted for inflation, it's around 10,000 of two days dollars for a transatlantic round trip, more or less. In communism, we didn't make 10,000 dollars a month, but we also didn't have to, because local prices were different. Tickets for supersonic flight from Moscow to modern Kazakhstan cost 80 rubles back in the 70s, which was about $130 at that time. It's difficult to adjust for inflation due to multiple Russian monetary reforms, but it was approximately 60% of the average monthly salary in the USSR at that time. Now the average monthly salary here in Russia is around 700 bucks, you do the math. Long story short, Tickets were cheaper, because Airflot was a government carrier, with prices introduced and enforced by communist party officials. Of course, a supersonic plane is not a cheap toy to play with, you can ask any private jet owner to have an idea. It needs a lot of fuel. Soviet Union did not care at all. In fact, Soviet Union did not care about money so much that one of the 17 planes was literally forgotten at the aviation plant. The Ministry of Aviation simply failed to claim the aircraft after it's been assembled, so one machine was sadly scrapped for metal even before receiving its serial number in the dark times of the empire collapse. You see, fuel economy was not even a scene for an oil superpower like Soviet Union. But the range of distance was. Russia is still the biggest country in the world, even after the USSR collapse. But the USSR was twice bigger. It's quite a task to fly from Kaliningrad to Vladivostok, 11 hours in air by today's standards. The goal of a passenger supersonic plane created in a closed militarized country with 11 time zones should be the interconnection of all major cities, and Tu-144 simply couldn't achieve it. So the only commercial flight that was approved by Airflot for this aircraft was Moscow Almaty. The plane was insanely expensive in maintenance. For example, plane windows were made from special glass to resist heat at supersonic speed, which was quickly becoming yellow under the sun 
and required expensive replacements. Landing gear needed to be replaced much more frequently compared to other planes due to high deterioration during landings. Spare parts logistics was more complex and expensive in general, because not every factory could produce components for this miracle of a plane. Another problem was the sonic boom. When you throw a stone into a pond, it creates waves, which disperse to every direction. Same thing happens with the air around a plane. When an aircraft penetrates the sound barrier, it sends sound waves from its front to the back where they come in resonance with the waves that were initially going backwards. Ever heard a modern fighter jet sound close? Well, that's a sonic boom. I live near the airport. Trust me, people who live near airports are not happy to hear sonic booms every 30 minutes, especially in the night. That creates the biggest problem of supersonic commercial technology implementation. Tests showed that even when a supersonic aircraft is at 20 km altitude, noise on the ground is still considerable. When a supersonic plane is lowering its altitude, glass in the windows nearby breaks. If you are planning to use this kind of aircraft, you obviously will try to use it to connect densely populated cities. But big cities have airports nearby people's homes. That's why Concorde was flying mostly transatlantic routes. Soviet Union simply didn't have adequate routes for Tu-144. If the original idea is to save some travel time, then constructing airports specially for the faster plane located two hours away from the cities of departure and arrival just to avoid sonic boom is a questionable decision. Another problem was the lack of adequate existing airports. My grandfather was sending one of these machines to its last decommissioned flight from Moscow to Samara, where it stays till now. He was originally offered to land an aircraft on a short runway. So he came to Samara before flying and asked a local commanding officer to take a ride with him in UAS, which is a Russian version of the Jeep Wrangler but with no amortization whatsoever. He decided to speed up the car to 90 km per hour on a runway and scared the guy to death. And then he simply asked, if this is scary, how do you expect me to land a huge supersonic plane at 320 km per hour landing speed on this 800 meters runway? So they gave him another landing field with a 5 km runway. To be honest, Tu-144 doesn't need all 5 km to land. But most airports don't have long enough runways. Not every airport could handle this plane. It was even worse for Concorde. Supersonics just need long runways to land safely. Period. This machine stays here in front of Zhukovsky Airport because it was originally tested here at one of the longest runways in Soviet Union. So supersonic planes initially created more problems than economic benefits. But engineers were slowly fixing problems. For example, the original Tu-144 machine had a range of distance slightly over 3000 km which made it kinda useless for expected long-haul flights. The Tupolev Bureau later improved the streamlining and the engines. New model Tu-144D, which stands for distance, was on par with Concorde. It could fly up to 5000 km. It's impressive, but it's still not quite what Communist Party officials expected from the plane that should have interconnected Kaliningrad to Vladivostok. You couldn't just put double the fuel into the same plane because the size and weight would grow proportionally and require even more fuel. Communist Party was eventually disappointed in the supersonic technology, so it was not a priority for the nation anymore. The improvement of the technology was not something unseen, it just needed more time. And then Soviet Union collapsed, which meant financial problems for the Tupolev Bureau, salary delays for the test pilots and literally new age of survival mode for skilled engine engineers who found themselves unclaimed and unemployed. Golden age for all kinds of thieves and vandals though. You know, when I was six years old, I used to walk with my grandpa in this forest that is actually a city park. So right there, about 500 meters from here was another plane. I don't know the model, but it was 1994, I think, and uh, we walked near this machine and Grandpa explained to me that this was like local uh, museum. 
So city administration put it there to show people. Uh, and then after one year, I didn't find the plane uh, on its spot. So I asked like, grandpa, what happened to the plane? And he said like, 90s happened. Vandals got to the plane and destroyed it to sell for scrap metal. That's why only seven machines are still more or less intact or restored nowadays. No competition, no progress. In capitalism it's all about not progress, but profit. Mighty supersonics stopped bringing profits and were abandoned. Too noisy, not so safe, not so comfortable and much more expensive. Customers voted with their money against the innovation. It was the dawn of a new era. Era of affordable flight tickets. Middle class customers chose a cheaper option. Now they could just sleep the extra time away at comfortable transatlantic business class seats of wide body planes. The wealthiest chose to buy private jets after getting used to the ultimate speed though. So the market for commercial supersonics was gone. Concorde's crash in Paris in 2000 was just a convenient cause for the profit-driven aviation managers to close an unprofitable project. Concorde touched the sky for the last time on 24th October 2003. Supersonic era ended that day. Now the biggest innovation we get from capitalism is an animated poo in our phones. But make no mistake about it, second coming of the supersonics is inevitable, sooner or later. Humanity always wanted bigger, better and faster things. This machine will not die in vain. Future generations will fly supersonic one day and laugh at our dark age of slow and boring but economically viable white body planes. Because brave people of the past who loved the sky once proved it was possible.